You feel through this very, very important town hall meeting. Um, we spent a lot of time organizing, and we want to thank all the people out in the community that spread the word through their email, through their social media, because we know uh, people coming out to these events are not just one organization or one person doing it. So we want to thank all the people who uh, spread the word and is out here, because this is a very important event. Um, because we do have a few politicians, representatives in the house, so it's always nice to have a nice gathering so that they can go back and tell their elected officials that this is an important issue for the community because they are willing to come out and attend a town hall meeting. Um, so, um, we just want to start. Um, LaShawn, are you going to, would you be able to change the... Okay. The way, that, the way that we're going to flow this is we're going to first um, have the first couple of speakers talk about the environmental issue, and then there will be some questions, but the questions will be, we're asking people to just ask a question and not necessarily make a statement, and then we're going to ask our panelists to answer those statements, those questions, and that'll be about 10 minutes, and then we're going to again go back to the presentation and continue up with the rest of the presentation, and then at the end, there will be an opportunity for people to stand up and speak, ask questions. I mean, I know a lot of people are here from, for different reasons, um, because this development proposing uh, just a slew of serious issues for the community from not only, you know, uh, detriment to our public spaces, but also uh, our rent stabilization is at risk, and all the other environmental issues. We call this the monster, and truly it is a monster that is being proposed. So I just, um, Sean, can you go to Okay, so I just wanted to, it's important that we understand a little bit about, a little bit of the history, so I just wanted to cover a little bit of the history. Um, in 1991, the community board and BBG was creating three major conservatories and we were very concerned about the possibility of three major sites that would have, that could have a lot of tall buildings. So they created a community plan and it's really important for us to understand that term, community plan, because um, the courts look at the community plan as something that the community wants and it's for the preservation or protection of something. And so they created the community plan and put height limits all along the perimeter of Franklin Avenue and Franklin Avenue, or Washington Avenue, excuse me, and Franklin Avenue, and it, which ranged from six to seven stories to 12 stories max. In their shadow study analysis, they said anything past 13 stories would be detrimental to the garden, and they wanted to make sure that they preserved the heights because 99% of the community had three to four story um, of buildings. So that was their rationale. Then Bruce Etchner, um, a real estate developer with a lot of money and a lot of connections and a lot of other developers started building up along the perimeter of Franklin Avenue in those three exact spots that the Department of City Planning had identified and said that these were serious potentials and we need to put high limits. So they started building up and now we are in an environmental review process with the largest of those developments. The other two developments, they did not have an environmental review and we will be filing a lawsuit on Monday against that because they did not have an environmental review. But this one is. And so let me just explain really quickly what an environmental review is about. It, all it says is that will this development have an environmental impact upon the community? And if so, what is that impact? And by law, they have to give very concrete information about those negative impacts. We had a scoping hearing, but maybe a lot of people already attended 
that are in the audience, where the audience and the community had a right to say what environmental issues they felt were necessary for the developer and the city to look at to just make a determination whether or not this development should go forward as planned or whether there should be quote unquote mitigating scenarios. A mitigating scenario just means where you will propose something different so that you would have less of a negative impact. Now let's be clear, environmental impacts do not stop development. Never has. They don't have that kind of teeth to them. What they do, however, is that it, it needs to be done correctly. So you need to show it correctly. You need to show what will happen to the community correctly. So, um, so we have a very short window of time to organize and stop and to mitigate or reduce this impact. We have now until the draft scope is presented. The draft scope would basically be whatever the developer and the city have decided would be the final product. Now there might be some tweaking of that along the EULA process, which is the Uniform Land Use Review process, but for the most part, what you see is what you're going to get. They always go very high and they always go a little crazy at the end because they want to negotiate and be where they really want to be anyway, which is a little bit more than where they are at now. So there might be some mitigating circumstances where they'll say, okay, instead of 483 feet, we'll go down to 400 feet because the community didn't like the 480 feet. And that's the kind of scenarios that they might produce. But once that draft scope is done, then we then move from the political pressure to a more legal pressure. Because trust me, we've watched these developments over and over throughout the city and we know that it's just a matter of time before the development winds up um, being passed into law. So I just wanted to have you step back and just um, talk about who we are. <laughs> we have been in the community since uh, 2014, and we did our first town hall meeting against a major rezoning. Just a show of hands, who was at that meeting? The, okay, great. So there's still a few people <laughs> that were there. And because we wanted to let you know this is, a, this is a long fight that we've been fighting. This is not the first time. What happened is, is that back in 2014, they wanted to do a district-wide rezoning. And they wanted to include Washington Avenue and Franklin Avenue in that rezoning under the guise that they wanted to have height protections. And we kept saying, well, wait a minute. That zone already has height protections. Why do you want to include it in a rezoning for height protections when it already has? Well, that's because when you do a district-wide rezoning, the city becomes the applicant on that rezoning. And it becomes a community plan. Community plans, the community cannot fight against community plans in the courts. Because it's the community that's creating the plan. So once the city decides it's going to rezone, then we would have had some yelling and screaming, some protests. But they would have rezoned that entire area and upzoned it. Because we know the Department of City Planning is just the arm of the real estate industry. Right. And so that's why we fought so hard for the last four years preventing Community Board 9 from submitting a request to do a district-wide rezoning. Some of us got arrested. <laughs> we did protests. We did demonstrations. I mean, can, can people who participated over the last four years in stopping, just raise your hand, please, in the audience, people who participated in stopping this major rezoning happening. Okay. You, yes, you need to be clapping for Because community plans you can't challenge in a court of law. Private developer plans, you can. And what's key here is that this private developer is trying to break a community plan that was created to protect the community. That's a very strong argument in the courts. But of course we're not there yet, right? We don't want to go to the courts because Lord knows that's struggle and a long time and money. Right. But we just want to let you know that's why they fought so hard to try to get a district-wide rezoning because once the city planning was going to do the rezoning, we, we lost. There would be nothing that we can do 
the Department of City Planning, they did 145 rezonings and 104, 145 rezonings got passed into law. It does not matter what the community says, the community can vote against it, it does not matter, the community board is just advisory. So we were able to keep a request from CB9 going into DCP, so now the developers have to do it on their own. And that's why we are here. Because we have been so successful at not letting them do a district-wide rezoning, they now have to go on their own. And so they're much more vulnerable, and we have a lot more power to stop them. Because now we are saying, hey, wait a minute, this is a, a community, this is a private developer who's breaking a community plan, and we, the community, don't want them to break our, we do not want them to break that community plan. And that should be the basis of what we're moving from. Okay. What we've done, we educate, we uncover, we foil, <laughs> we, uh, uh, we have yelled, we have, we have sued, we have filed lawsuits, we got bad reputations in the community. <laughs> our, our elected officials do not like us at all. <laughs> um, um, but we've been successful, and that's really important. Our strategies have worked, and they have kept this community safe, and that's really important. So now I'm going to now we're going to go into the environmental portion of this uh, presentation, and we're going to have Nick come and speak. Now we've been studying this environmental issue for the last six months, and Nick is one of our experts in regards to that. You can sit if you want, because there's a mic right there. Um, and he's our expert in environmental, and he's going to explain to you why we are looking at water and sewage and solid waste and sewage services. Thank you, Nick. Hello. Um, my name is Nick Smith. I'm a tutor at New York City College of Technology here in Brooklyn, and I'm very much interested in how the proposed building project and rezoning would affect the gardens. Uh, it is suffice to say that the high-rise towers would have a major detrimental effect. Uh, first of all, the proposed uh, 1,478 dwelling units of the 960 Franklin rezoning would be more than double the 400 unit threshold for assessment of wastewater and stormwater uh, conveyance systems in the uh, EIS, that's the environmental impact uh, statement. Uh, this to identify significant adverse impacts, including compliance. Um, interference with the uh, state mandate necessary to meet water quality standards. New York City's sewage system is operating under multiple administrative and consent orders dating back to 1992 for permit violations and combined sewer discharges that detail violations in all areas of sewage system management. Um, these would include uh, state pollution discharge elimination standards, uh, combined sewage overflow controls, and sewage pipe backup elimination. All three issues apply to the area in Brooklyn in which this project and many more are um, looking or to, uh, to hook into the already uh, overcapacity system. Um, the facility that would be most affected by this project would be the Owl's Head Wastewater Treatment Plant. At present, um, even a relatively small amount of stormwater, um, for example, one twentieth of an inch of rainfall, can overwhelm aging and clogged system components at that facility and trigger CSO discharges. Uh, the New York State Department of Environmental uh, Conservation has identified CSOs as the largest source of pathogens in the New York Harbor system due to their contribution to fecal coliform. Um, so that would be major. Um, this project would only add to the toxic soup that flows untreated out into our waterways. Uh, the overcapacity system would be seriously affected in storm situations. Um, but as I said earlier, uh, 
just a, um, a small amount would uh, contribute to that, um, let alone a, storm, a big storm situation such as a hurricane or something like that. Um, what do the planners propose to do to address this problem? They have been silent on this issue. Uh, it would seem to me that this is a case of massive, mass, massive uh, magical thinking. Uh, they seem to think that these sewage system uh, issues will simply disappear uh, as if by magic. Um, and I submit to you that that, that is simply not true. Um, they, they're not going to disappear. Um, I would also like to say a few words about the solid waste and sanitation services. This category of impact analysis was improperly um, left out of the DSOW. DSO uh, New York's 8 million residents generate 14 million tons of waste per year. Essentially, two separate systems handle this waste. Uh, these would be private carbon companies which serve businesses, um, while the New York City Department of Sanitation serves residential buildings. Uh, transfer stations for this waste have been capped under Local Law 152. Uh, accordingly, this uh, proposed project would only add to the increasing and cumulative demand for the uh, solid waste handling capacity from the Department of Sanitation. Um, uh, therefore, um, the evaluation of solid waste must be assessed with regard to Local Law 152 of the New York City Administrative Code, that would be Section 28-318.1. Uh, uh, um, just to conclude, neither the water and, uh, and sewage issues nor the uh, solid waste management issues have been addressed with regard to this proposed project. The planners for the project um, should not be allowed to flout the regulations and assessment requirements in such a cavalier and capricious uh, fashion. Um, thank you very much. The reason why we're focusing on water and sewage is because there are laws that protect us against polluting our sewage system. There are no laws against putting shadows on the garden. There are no laws for increasing population. There are no laws, well there's a small law for migratory birds, but it's not a very strong law. However, sewage and solid waste, there are laws. And when you violate those laws, that gives you arguments in the courts to make sure that they do the right thing. And if they don't do the right thing as far as mitigating circumstances, then we have a basis to challenge them in a court of law. So that's the reason why we're focusing on the water and sewage. And also, we should be concerned about our water and sewage. <laughs> you know, because every time it rains, it overflows and our, what we, poop into the toilet, go straight into the harbor untreated. Literally, every time it rains. So when you're adding, with the combined rezoning, about another 4,000 residential units, how many, how many toilets is that? How many, okay, so you get the picture. We got some serious pollution going on. Okay, so now we're going to go to our uh, another topic, um, which is the shadow, sun glare, and migratory birds. This is going to be given by Janine, our warrior from the Stoddard, Stoddard, Stoddard. Stoddard. So, you know, I'm sure you've been looking at these pictures. Um, you know, there was a shadow study done in 1991, and despite our many efforts, no one seems to be able to produce that shadow study that showed the police over 15 stories would shadow the garden and cause all this damage. No one can produce this study. However, Cornell Realty managed to produce a study that showed remarkably that the shadow stopped right at the edge of the garden. We couldn't go inside at all. So we looked at this and we thought, mm -hmm. so we commissioned two professional studies. And uh, lo and behold, we have 17 and a half acres of shadows over the gardens, what, 50 acres or something, and for three seasons out of four, and for four hours every morning. At the scoping hearing, 
at um, the Department of City Planning, the BPG Director of Living Collections said that the shadows caused by this continuing project would cause half the plant collection to die in 10 years. He also said that there's no way to move the conservatory, the greenhouses and the nurseries out of harm's way, that there are no commercial options available to them for bringing new plant life. They're under, they participate with organizations all over, they trade plants with organizations all around the world. They're bound to, you know, they're a scientific institution as well as a beautiful place to be. And, um, and there are simply no commercial options available to them uh, that wouldn't require them to use pesticides and all, all sorts of things that they would expose both the workers and the people who visit the garden to dangerous chemicals for no reason. So, presumably, um, our study showed what the 91 shadow study showed, and um, I, which causes me to, I always ask this question, have the sun and the earth changed in their relationship since 1991. <laughs> why are we having this conversation? Why is this, so why is this developer allowed to, I'd like to build 44 stories right on the edge of the botanic garden. Why is he allowed, why is anyone taking him seriously? Why is the city taking him seriously? Why are they pursuing an illegal spot rezoning to make it happen? Why are they doing it? So, the other side of shadows is sun, like, you are correct, money is the answer. So, the, the, the other side of shadows is sun glare. So when the sun is setting, these glass towers will now have cast glare into the garden. And uh, glare is cast in the same shape as the shadows, and it can be just as destructive. Uh, let's say 90% of any energy efficient windows that are used in the construction that it reflects sunbeams at up to 200 degrees Fahrenheit. So there have been reported cases of gardens and cars and rooftops being born, uh, burned by reflected sunlight. In London, a tower melted a Jaguar parked on the street. A Las Vegas tower nearly blinded people in a swimming pool in the midday. So, and in those two cases, the problem was corrected, but it's not always correctable. And this is why I always say, you know, desecration is forever. It's the, once these buildings go up and destroy the whole oasis, nature, the garden, you know, they're not coming down. So we have to prevent them from going up. Um, there's a, we hold, uh, often hold up as an example, the sculpture garden in Dallas. There's a Nasher, the Nasher Sculpture Center in Dallas. They built a glass tower next to it. It scorched its shape into the garden. And it, um, it uh, raised the indoor temperatures uncomfortably in the building. It damaged artwork and it interfered with their display. It was casting new shadows. And this has been going on for eight years. The show, the building was featured in a British TV series you might have seen called Engineering Catastrophes. So we could have an engineering catastrophe here. You know, they could build it and say, like, oh, we'll use these special kind of windows that don't glare. But you don't know until it's up there. Um, and then, there's the birds. Okay, so, and I, I was on some list, I was on some thread, you know, like a, a real deal or cranes, and somebody was saying, now they're asking about the birds. <laughs> <laughs> and yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> The executive director of New York City Audubon told uh, city planning at the scoping hearing on those open front. Glass towers at this location have created an especially deadly ob obstacle for migrating birds, all of which are protected by federal law. Buildings adjacent to natural areas provide, provide an exceptionally high risk to birds because they do not perceive that clear or reflective surface is actually a solid barrier. So they see a tree reflected and they fly into the tree and they don't see that it's a wall. And they break their necks or they have brain trauma or they smash to the ground. New York City kills 90,000 to 200,000 birds a year already. Wow. And sparrows and warblers, which we see everywhere around here, are particularly vulnerable to this kind of they make this mistake a lot, and they have a way of calling to each other that draws other birds into the 
you know, the bad flight path. So this is, they have no plans to, to, to study this issue unless we, we make them do it. So join me and make them do it. Leading from that, from that discussion, we are now going to Carrie, and she's going to be talking about the fact that the garden is actually a park, and as a park, a state park, it has certain types of rules and regulations that they are protection of, and she's going to explain what those protections are. Hi, thank you. To this panel. Thank you, thank you. I'm new to the panel and I do have a chief concern with the Brooklyn Botanic Garden. I've volunteered with them many years and I love the car. And um, I just, when I heard about this project, I said I could help. This is insane. That they're going to build, what, four towers, three towers, five towers in our neighborhood, in this neighborhood, and they're going to shadow the park, those towers. And the objective here is to recognize the fact that the Brooklyn Botanic Garden is a park land. That whole area, from the ground to the heavens, is protected by federal law, okay, state law. Although it's a protectorate of the city of New York, the state has already regulated laws. It's already been legislated that it cannot happen. They are not supposed to shadow the park, interfere with any of that area. And that was established in 1897. So the developers, whatever they are thinking about, they're ignoring all of this and ignoring the community's right over 900,000 people come every year. The seeds are grown in those, in those that conservatory buildings where the shadows will be passed on. The seeds mean that the garden continues. If we don't have the seeds, we can't have any plants. Okay, and they can't move them. As Janine said, they're not planning to relocate those buildings because they've been there for over 60 or 70 years. The second thing is it's a trust. So the city is supposed to take care of it based on the legislation that's already been established. So the city is at fault if this happens. The city would be wrong for allowing this to happen. Okay, light, air, and the airspace are critical components to the park, as we know. And this is clear. It sounds like a, a monster getting ready to come into this neighborhood. It's going to bring uh, a total disregard of what we've enjoyed, what makes Brooklyn tick. The Brooklyn Botanic Garden is a draw. This looks ridiculous in terms of someone coming into the city and saying, I'm coming to Brooklyn to see the Botanic Garden and where these shadows are. We have children that we educate at the garden year round for 30 years. There's an education program. Now, how can we explain an education program that has shadows? from somebody who's just making money in this community. I mean, what do we get in exchange for that? We're not gonna get anything. But as we've discussed here, pollution, congestion, and a 10-year program that will probably, if we won't, we'll be alive, but it won't be, it won't be the same program that we know. I also wanna discuss the fact that Brooklyn Botanic Garden has not come forward. I'm a volunteer. I go there once a week. If they call me, I, I, I recently stopped going, but I did enjoy going there. But they are not doing the shadow study. They are not presenting themselves as saying, this is our, they have made statements, but they're not here now at this panel. They are letting this, 
there's not saying much to this development. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, who would have? And you can make them come forward because they know the artist is on them to protect these this park land. You know, can you imagine letting the city bring this to the fore and wiping out this neighborhood like this pandemic? It cannot happen. So can you please come with us? <coughs> and um, let's get on board with fighting. I just wanted to add, um, we hired an environmental lawyer, and she's the one who came up and found this law about the state. And it states that because it's a park, park land and park air is treated the same. So just like you can't sell park land to a private developer unless you get a legislative directive from the state, you can't sell this air either. When you allow a developer to build in shadow, you're selling off the shaded area to the developer because you're saying, okay, we know that the garden needs the sun, but you need to build a 42-story building, so we're going to let you take the air rights of the garden. And that's what we're saying. And she gave us that legal argument so that we can hold on to that legal argument and understand that the city who's conducting this environmental process does not have the right or the authority to allow a developer to take our air and use it for their own personal use. They do not have that right. They have to get it from the state. And that's the law. So we're just trying to let you know what are some of the legal issues here. Okay. Um, so what we're going to do right now, we have the 10 minutes. So could you time us? Does anybody have any questions for the panel who has already asked? We're not asking for statements. Please push questions. Okay. Um, right now, they they are saying they're using that magic number 39, so it doesn't sound like 40. <laughs> but they actually want to go up 483 feet. So if you use 10 a story, 10 feet per story, it's like 48 stories. They want to go up to 48, 483, and that includes the fresh program plus the Bulkheads. Yes, there, there are two different rezonings that are happening. One, we already said that the Cornell Realty one did not do an environmental impact, so we're taking them to court. We will be filing our court papers on Friday or Monday. Right. Um, yes, you, and then I know she's somebody. Could you do me a favor? Because I never have a very good way of figuring out who. Can you just. Stand up to the mic, and then if you stand up to the mic, then whoever stands up to the mic, I will ask you a question. Uh, who would you like to address? Yeah, hi. Yeah. Uh, the garden's enormous, and the environment's very tremendous. How are you doing this morning, I think? Have you approached the area? Mine's much closer. Yes, we have approached the BG. We have demanded that they speak with us. First, they denied even knowledge of the event. We had to protest several times to get them to even recognize that this was going on. We had to protest again. <laughs> so we protested three or four times just to get them to make a, an official statement on the record. So we're gonna talk about PBG a little bit later with our guest speaker. Um, but yes, we, we, brought, we have reached out to them. They're refusing to meet with us. Um, you know, and that's been their position. And we have petitions, we've done... No, they're petitions. They are, they're petitions. But you can't read Okay. Hi, I just want to thank you guys for the work you've done already, because I'm from Maple Street to the Independence Association, and I know this costs a lot of money and time out of your pockets and, and, you know, your lives. So thank you for what you're doing and keep on. My question is, when is the proposal groundbreaking for this, if they do get through it, and when do they project it will be finished? Like, so what's the time table, like 20, yeah, 20, 20 yeah. That's that, that good, I hope not, but like, what are they thinking? Well, you know, if they, you know, if everything was smoothly, and we don't anticipate that happening. <laughs> 
Um, they're talking about breaking ground by next year. Hi, this is the local law for the sewage and the solid waste um, New York City truck. Oh, it is? I didn't see the actual. I believe it's law 152. Let me just double check. Yeah. Lo local law 152. Uh, and. Uh, Section 20. And right. Uh, it's, it's code, uh, New York City Administrative Code, Section uh, 28 uh, 318.1. Okay. It's if you want to um, do a face over the thousands of miles that they that they travel but when they cross cities they 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 focus on green spaces so that's why these buildings are particularly dangerous to birds because they're on the edge of the garden and from a bird's point of view the park right these shadows and these shadows are all the way to Prospect Park so it's it's um, uh, I, I, I couldn't say like what what would happen to them or how many of them would would die, but it's it, it's like wildlife is under siege from reckless real estate development. We have fires in the west because people are just building into the woods and into the woods and into the woods and the one broken power line and bang the whole the whole you know five hundred thousand acres burns. So. This is all part of a larger issue. That uh, the Audubon Society, they're pressing for the city council is is actually considering legislation to make uh, to to protect better protect our birds. And um, this federal law, there is some talk of strengthening it. I can't imagine it happening during the Trump administration, but we we plan to outlive them. So. <laughs> We will have that legislation someday, but you know, I, I mean, it, it, it's often true that we, we, the way we write our laws, it sometimes seems like we will do things to defend a turtle or a fish that we won't do to defend our own lives. It strikes me as bizarre all the time, but that's that's what happens, which is why they, you know, the, the right wing rails against the Indian Species Act and stuff because we were able to use it because human life is incredibly cheap. And so but we're trying to, you know, to use to substitute animals for humans in some way. So um, uh, I hope did I answer your question? Um, but anyway, so we're gonna go back to uh, our pamphlets and we're gonna talk about one of the most important topics because one of the ways in which the media at, has been pushing this. They've been pushing shadows versus affordable housing. And I even had reporters say, oh, they're gonna provide 50% below market rate housing. This is what the affordable now seems to mean to the mass, the, the media. And, um, but we have analyzed and took apart their proposal, their so-called affordable housing proposal. And we have Todd, who's going to uh, explain what that analysis is. Thank you. Allow your street parking to be utterly eliminated, your garden to be 50% dead within 10 years, hundreds of newcomers to the neighborhood, is that there's, it's allegedly gonna offer desperately needed affordable housing. And it is desperately needed, but as many of you know at this point, in New York City, so-called affordable housing is not always so affordable. Before you really get into this, just a couple of definitions. 
if you are paying 30% of your income mm -hmm. on rent, according to HUD, that is rent burden. Mm -hmm. If you're paying 50% of your income on rent, that's severely rent burden. So, while this developer has stated that 50% of the units will be quote unquote affordable, it turns out when you look closely, they are not constructing one single apartment that would not leave a resident of Crown Heights rent burdened. So, getting into that, New York City, you calculate affordability using area median income, or AMI. The AMI in Crown Heights South, according to the 2010 census, was about $40,000. Some sources say now, for a family of four, it might be as high as about $45,000. But when New York City calculates affordability, when HUD does it, they calculate the AMI using all five boroughs, parts of Rockland County, Putnam County, and Westchester County. For a family of four, New York City's AMI that they're using is $104,000. That's more than double the AMI in this community. So from the very beginning, any conversation about affordable housing is totally disingenuous and totally removed from this local context. So, in order to receive the building permissions under the MIH program, that's going to allow them to build as tall as they want, they need to offer 30% of units that are affordable to families earning on average 80% of the AMI. They can break that down a lot of different ways, but regardless, that 80% is over $83,000 per year in income. So again, while that family of four from Westchester that earns $85,000 might be able to afford the apartment, that's, that's going to be a rent burden for any typical resident of Crown Heights. They've also indicated, the developers indicated that they'll be applying for HUD funding. That means they're applying to use your tax dollars to build this. In order to get that HUD funding, that requires that 20% of the total units be affordable for families at 50% AMI. But again, that's our Westchester AMI. So even those units are still, quote, rent burdens for Crown Heights residents. And additionally, what they don't want you to know is that they can do what's called double dipping. They can use the same units to qualify for that HUD funding that they're using to qualify for the MIH restrictions. Meaning that only 30% of the overall units are going to be subject to any of those restrictions. The other 20% of so-called affordable units those can be up to 165% AMI. That just means all it has to be is affordable for a family earning $172,000 a year. That's almost four times the AMI for Crown Heights South. I know that we're getting into a mess of numbers, and the developer is counting on the fact that we're going to get lost in the numbers, and that we're going to take them at their word when they say 50% of units affordable. But what's important to remember is that when we look closely, when we really get into their numbers, this developer has not committed to building one unit that would leave a resident of Crown Heights not rent burdened. And most of those that are still so-called affordable would leave residents here severely rent burdened. So maybe you're thinking, I don't mind paying more than 30%. I know HUD calls that a rent burden, but hey, I'm already paying 40%. That doesn't matter because you won't be allowed to live in the building. If you apply and they determine that it would be a rent burden for you, your application won't be. So there we go. The developer must be forced to commit in writing to what income restrictions they will really be following. They're never going to do anything out of generosity. That means they have to be committed in writing. We need to force our public officials to put that in writing, to hold them accountable, and to come up with a realistic plan for units that are actually truly affordable that would not be a rent burden to the residents of Crown Heights. Thank you. So, there are a lot of things that they want, um, and it's up to us to make sure that they don't get it. So, what we have here on, on the um, right side is the mandatory inclusionary housing program and, and what they get when they participate in MIH. And if you guys remember, uh, what's the number of community boards that voted against MIH? Well, 51. So, uh, we got 51, 52 out of 59, but that's the majority, vast majority of the community boards voted against MIH. Um, MIH is going to allow the developers to build 
to increase their height so that they can supply us with affordable housing. Um, one of the things that you'll notice is that the current height limit is six to seven stories. It's very, very low. And we're going up to this ridiculous height of over, over 40 stories when you include the bulkheads. Um, they'll be allowed to build that high because they're going to offer affordable, they're going to offer the FRESH program. Mind you, Cornell is also getting this FRESH program. There's a supermarket up the block. And it's how many supermarkets do we need in this area? And, and those supermarkets are just getting more and more expensive um, as we, we notice by the day. So with MIH, MIH, there's no funding that the developer is getting. All of the funding is coming from HUD. Um, so we've got, uh, the other thing that they'll get with MIH is they get the reduction in the parking requirements, which someone mentioned earlier, being concerned about parking. So when you build a development, you're supposed to provide 40% uh, of, the, of your units that you have in the building, you're supposed to provide 40% of the parking spaces. This developer is asking for a reduction to reduce it to 143 um, parking spaces, I believe. So if you think of the units they're providing, I believe it's about 1,500 units is what they say they're going to build. So they should technically provide like, what, 600 parking spaces. And they're asking to reduce that number to 140. So they're, they're really asking for a lot. Um, the other thing that we have here, <laughs> they're, they're claiming that they're only going to build to a 9.7 FAR, uh, but they are legally allowed 10. So any, again, any of these promises that are made in writing that are completely opposite of what they are allowed to do by law, there's, there's no reason that we should take their word for, for this because they are allowed to build to a 10 FAR. Um, so any, anything they put in, in writing that's against the law, it's just there's no point in paying any attention to it because they can, they can build more. Um, one of the 20% the affordable units, 20% of the affordable units, uh, as Todd said earlier, will, will, are going to go to people who make $172,000 because technically under the law, that is considered affordable. That is the highest level of money that you can make and still be considered, you, you can qualify for affordable housing. And when you look at these numbers, it's just important to realize how ridiculous these are. It's one of, there's a study out, I can't remember the organization right now, but anything that does not look at affordability as 30% AMI is not affordable. When you look at a map of the city and what people are making and what people can afford, you need, you need to have affordable units that are at 30% of the AMI, 30% to 40%. Uh, anything else is just outrageous. You are not going to be housing a single mother with children. You're not going to be housing seniors. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just not going to happen. Um, the other thing that's happening is that 100% of this money is, is our money. It's money from the city, it's money from the government, it's, it's our tax dollars that this developer is going to use to create this development. They're not going to use any of their funding. They're, the amount of tax breaks that they're getting from this development, and they're all on our backs. It's all on our backs. Our taxes go up every year. This guy is going to go tax-free with this huge development for 30, 40 years. So again, we, we need to make sure that our money is spent the way we want it to be spent. <laughs> the other thing to be mindful of is that this, uh, currently the development is going through the Department of City Planning. Um, and they are considered the lead agency. Yes, very much a boo. Very much a boo. So the thing to know, not that HPD is much better, but because these developers are applying for federal money, HPD should actually be the lead organization. They should be the ones to do the environmental review, and that's something that we need to push for that HPD become the lead organization. We already know DCP is horrible, we have had our experiences with DCP, and now this is an opportunity to at least try fighting another beast 
to get them to do the right thing for this development because they're asking for so much money, you know, they're double dipping to get that HPD funding. So that's something that we really need to push for. Uh, because this developer has spent a lot of money lobbying the Department of City Planning. So it'll be a lot of fun to have them realize that they've spent, uh, what's the number, $164,000 lobbying DCP and then all of a sudden we change, we change the game and they'll have to go deal with HPD. So we really need to stay on top of these things. We really need to make sure we know what it is these folks are asking for, what, it is, what, what is ours, what, what, are, what, are we, what are they trying to take from us? Because that's, that's all this is. These guys want everything for free. Uh, floor area ratio? Yeah, floor, floor area ratio. That just means the amount of billable space that a building can build. So for example, if you had this square footage here, and you had a three far, you could probably build three stories. Oh, can I get another? <laughs> three, just imagine three stories, because you have a, a far of three. However, if you get a FAR of 10, you can build now 10 stories. So developers are always looking for FAR. They always want to increase the FAR because then they can build a lot more buildings on it. So the MIH was, okay, you give us some affordable, we'll let you build taller. We'll let you increase your FAR. Yeah. There's that, and then also the large scale general development will allow them to do other things, like not, not build a wider base, not build the street space. They're, they're going to get a lot of allowances yeah, they're going. They're actually asking to have less space in between the buildings. They're allowing to have less sunlight and air to come in between the buildings. You know, there's a lot of provisions that they are asking for that the law would allow them to do. Um, that they would just build these tall, tall, tall buildings. There'd be no space in between, and it'd just be packed tight right up to the. Okay, you get the idea. So now we're going to go to the rent stabilization um, because there are some buildings that are within the zone that's being rezoned um, that is not a part of this plan, but what the Department of City Planning did was extend the boundaries so they could include other properties that would also get the new rezoning, and there's some danger to the rent stabilization buildings that will be rezoned, and we have Julia that will be discussing that. There are close to a million rent stabilized apartments in New York City. That's 2.5 million people living in this. Two thirds are low income, one fourth are seniors. It's an essential form of a stable way of living in New York City. But over the last de decade, New York City has lost almost 200,000 units. Nearly one-fifth of all rent-stabilized apartments have been deregulated. Then the landlords can change what, charge whatever they want if it is unregulated apartment, whatever they can get. So if it's deregulated, is a deregulated, stabilized apartment the sky's the limit, making it rent burden for everyday New Yorkers. It used to be impossible to deregulate a rent stabilized unit, but in 1994, the rent, I'm sorry, the real estate lobby pushed forth laws through the city council called um, vacancy decontrol, which was baked in with baked in loopholes to help the landlord hit the mark of deregulation. It's most brutal in low income and communities of color, but everyone is vulnerable. It allows landlord de landlords, developers, and city council to see our homes and our neighborhoods as unrealized income. The developer and the landlord harass, endanger, and evict thousands of tenants, according to the organization, Housing justice. In the state of in the state of New York, a hundred units are evicted each day. Most of them are in our own rural of Brooklyn, where they are where they flip buildings and 
whole neighborhood, and it's only getting worse. The most at risk of us are those who have preferential rents, our newest neighbors. But the most at risk of them are our newest neighbors. Our older tenants, our oldest neighbors, have rent stabilization. They have the most protection under the law. Let me spell that out to you when it comes to development on Franklin Avenue. Many of the apartments in the proposed rezone area are preferential rates. There are four additional plants, four, four additional lots being rezoned that the city and the developer plans are ignoring. 1015 Washington Avenue, 1035 Washington Avenue are to be rezoned from R6A to R9B, increasing it to 300% increase of buildable space. That, that is an incentive to destroy and rebuild. Landlords will say he needs the entire lot of the higher zone to allow him to make money, which is his right as a landowner. 95% of his appeals are being approved. No public review process. Landlords have, landlords do not have to renew leases if they want to demolish the building. They have to show that they can financially rebuild it. They only have to show that they can financially rebuild it. The total of 180 rent stabilized apartments will be lost by this rezoning. If you think it won't happen here, that's what the people in Greenwich Village thought too. Greenwich Village against NYU, Massive Redevelopment Unit. They protested, they signed petitions, they had meetings, and they lost. Brooklyn Heights had a protest, Save the View. They hired a lawyer who met with the city council. The city council failed to tell them that the timetable was running out on them so that they could make a actual um, protest to the river. They have lost their view. But there are laws. To end residential segregation, the law imposed requirements that jurisdictions receiving federal housing funding bar discrimination and affirmatively further fair housing. The Fair Housing Act also uses proactive steps to promote housing choice to ensure low-income people living in segregated neighborhoods achieve equality of opportunity. What do we do? The developers want us to discuss the issue. They want us to fight among ourselves. They want us to wait until it's too late to do anything productive and legal and take any legal action. The Fair Housing Act laws have timetables and deadlines that are non-negotiable. We need to push back against the real estate interest for drooling over our homes. We need to know what time it is. We have a special guest speaker, and this is a man that um, has been just known through the cultural institution world as a great organizer. I watched him bring thousands of people together in protest, and that matters. And so he's gonna come and speak to us about the role of cultural institutions, um, their boards, and give us some of his uh, secrets to how he's been able to um, influence uh, cultural institutions and addressing the needs of the community. Uh, my name is Ani, um, but I think what uh, Alicia didn't say is that we, BAN and MTOP and a lot of groups came together around certain institutions like the Brooklyn Museum, like BBG, um, now the Whitney, and the question is why would you do that? 
it's not like museums are in all, that's what our focus is, but I think that the same people that are developing our communities, quote and unquote, really displacing us, dispossessing us, transferring wealth upward, that's what's happening. So when these high rises happen, people are gonna lose their home, lose their wealth, lose their time, travel further away to their jobs, travel outside of the city, outside of the state, your social fabric gets broken down, you find yourself in debt and depressed, and this is onward, what's gonna happen, and we see it happening all over, and it's happening in the Bronx now. And there's a role for art and artists in this that's being mobilized by the city and mobilized by the developers. Another way of saying that is that they're weaponizing us against ourselves, right? Because it's not like the artists are making money out of this, but someone's making a lot of wealth. And so the question is, how do we build power? Because what's happening is a war against us and how do we fight it? And one of the things that we've done together is that we recognize that these developers are also on the board of cultural institutions that are well respected and that we cherish. In other words, David Berliner is on the Brooklyn Museum board. This was a demand of this community. That same developer developed Barclay Center, promised affordable housing, promised jobs, none of it. They're doing it here too, and he's right around the corner, right? These people have cocktails together, and they talk about all of us, how we're not gonna be here, and they sip on it. That's how they do it, right? So one of the things that we have to do is not just think about resistance and organizing, but think about how do we resist effectively? How do we not keep doing the things that are not working, but doing things that actually work and multiply them? I think that this fight is a really important fight for the entire city. And I think that if it's done right, you will galvanize the entire city. Because all boroughs have been organizing around gentrification, and very few boroughs have succeeded at it. So what happens if this becomes a place of citywide organizing right, against this? This means, in a way, that you, you're building power over time, and you really kind of are pushing the developers out. Because just voting is important, but won't do. Law is not justice. Appealing to law is a tactic. That's all it is. It's a, it's a language, right? And it's an important language, right? But how do we make their lives of these people actually difficult? How do we hurt their brand? How do we hurt their names? How do they worry about who's talking about them? How do their faces show up on the news? And how do they worry about going to check up on the building that they're building when it's being built? Part of the organizing we did around Amazon that all of us were respons like, responsible for is we knew what was up. And that became a citywide fight. And in that fight, I knew groups that are out of Queens saying, they build it, we'll burn it. There's an act. It's a war on us. That doesn't mean this. That doesn't mean this community is going to do it, right? But it does mean that we need to think of all the tactics and strategies because at the end of the day, we need to resist effectively. If we don't, we lose our homes, we lose our families, and the shit's real, right? So. Places like BBG, if they don't show up here, you go to them. And if that's not enough, you go to their trustees' homes. You make sure their neighbors know where they live, right? And you make sure you put them on blast, and that's just the start. Same with the Brooklyn Museum. Don't tell me you care about the community, invite us every Saturday, right? And you're the same people that are calling the cops on you, because part of what's happening right now is when these high rises come up, so come the cops. Yes. Yes. And so do people get shot and people go to jail and then for the safety of your family, you'll leave. Mm -hmm. It's not even the money at that point. So all of these things are getting lined up and then the question is, we have to be reasonable. And the thing is, is the whole thing is unreasonable. So on us, we have to be reasonable. And I think that that's part of like what happened over here is like we know we know our shit. We've seen it time and time again. So then, what is the diversity of tactics and strategies that we're deploying to make sure that they know we're for real? 
Brooklyn Museum, you know what? If you don't care about people of color and black people, you're racist. You have a role here in the community, not to just put art shows about black power. Do you know what I'm saying? It's happening right now. The same conversation that was happening in the 60s, that was happening since the Reconstruction era, is still going on right now. And then all of a sudden, the laws over here are protecting them. It's just like, oh, we need to give them our taxes? Look at Citibank. They don't pay taxes. Anyone that has money doesn't pay taxes. But they take us on turnstall jumping. <laughs> And all I'm just, the only reason I'm bringing this up is because it is important to consider all the at, all the ways we can resist, all the ways we can use our privilege, all the ways in which we can go after our elected officials, of course. We can hold our cultural institutions accountable. You talk the talk, walk the walk, right? And when those fancy cars come into your neighborhood, you know what? They should at least know they may get keyed. Is that part of it? They're making people poor. They're making people poor, and then they're paying black and people of color to actually make murals that all of a sudden are talking about nothing, and they're saying they're beautifying our neighborhoods. That's what they're doing. They, no, they're, it's not beautiful at all, right? So I think I'm, I'm raising these things, and I'll end here. I think that it's not unreasonable to go after cultural institutions. It actually makes a lot of sense, and here's why. You need to make your own stories. That's how we make them. Because Democracy Now!, NY1, maybe doesn't want to cover all of this. But they'll cover something that happens at the Brooklyn Museum. And then you use that as a platform. And you're just like, well, why are you here? What's wrong with the Brooklyn Museum? And you're just like, because these people are helping be us being displaced. They're helping those people displace us. Right? So that's one thing. The same with BBT. There's all sorts of ways now in which if you begin to target these cultural institutions, and obviously you're amazing at research, then you're either with us or against us. There is no middle. There is no middle. You're either with us or against us. And you know what? Here's what it looks like to be with us, and here's what it looks like to be against us. In that process, then you can begin to think about membership boycott. You can begin to think about all of these ways that draw in a lot of artists and people that are on your side that are probably gentrifying because they have nowhere to go in the city, but now they're throwing down for a fight they believe in because we're building and we're knowing that this struggle over here, just with shade and birds, is our entire struggle in this city. And one win gives us the imagination and the power to actually say other communities can do it this way. Because we can bring out the Bronx, we can bring out Staten Island right here because it matters. But that means when we're talking about these four or five buildings and 40 stories, what we're also talking about, that's an intersection of a lot of struggles. So let's talk about it. Let's talk about those buildings being on stolen land. Let's talk about long-term displacement. Let's talk about all this racist shit that goes on with developers. Let's talk about money and politics. Because then all these little groups that are working in issue silos see this as everything. And that's how we get a thousand people, including you. Tickets, you now have to spend $300 to go to an event at BBG. $300 to go to an event at BBG. Okay? I mean, how is that? And yet you close the doors on the community. Our children can't go there any longer. Our seniors can't go there any longer. Okay? And we to start demanding that BBG respect us and meet with us. That's right. So that is our way. And we want to know exactly what the fuck are you doing? What are you doing? We want to see your plan. We want to see your plan. Because BBG got a lot of fucking power. And they got a lot of money. And if this deal is going down, it's because somebody said it's okay. <laughs> they know it's gonna burn. They know it's gonna kill. They know all of that. And they already figured out how they're gonna soup it over to you. That's right. They already know this. And we need to put some fire under their asses. Okay.